I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Laureate in Economics in 2001, University Professor of Economics at Columbia University, and author of several books, including his most recent, People, Power, and Profits, Progressive Capitalism for an Age of Discontent. Joe has been involved with INET for many years and is co-chair with Mike Spence of our Commission on Global Economic Transformation. Joe will be talking, us today, talking to us today about reevaluating the policy response to the pandemic. We currently find ourselves in an unprecedented economic situation because unlike previous economic crises where we were faced with either a supply side shock or a demand side shock, we are in a situation now where we are going to have to deal with both and the standard policies that economists rely on in recessions may not be up to the task. We have seen an unprecedented response from the government in response to the pandemic, but there are real questions as to whether it has been sufficient or efficient. Joe has been tracking this response closely and we are delighted that he can share some of his insights with us here today. A few words about the structure of the webinar. After INET's president, Rob Johnson, says a few words, Joe will present for about half an hour and we will then open it up for questions. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A icon. You can type in your questions there and we will get to as many as we can in the time we have. Rob, over to you. Thank and you, you're Pia. still muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Good. Yes. Thank you, Pia, and welcome everyone. I guess uh, I just wanted to bear witness to the depth and duration that Joe Stiglitz has been an influence at INET. I met Joe in the fall of 1980 when I was a graduate student at Princeton, Bob Solo, and Charles Kindedberger told me that's the place I had to go to graduate school because he was going to come there and he was the most creative person in the discipline. Within two years, I got a taste of that because I took his course in advanced theory with three other students and we all walked home. And I remember they said, this course is amazing. We derive everything every day. We don't study papers. We build them together. And then Joe tricked us all at the end of a year with a general exam where he said, what you really should do is recognize that you've been studying economics for a long time, but after tomorrow, when you finish your general exams, you're going to start creating economics. So let's get a head start. For the next three hours, tell me what's not in the literature that you would like to see. And I remember when we turned that paper over and we all looked at each other, we just like, it, it was almost like that's exactly what I should have thought Joe Stiglitz would ask. Afterwards, I remember talking with my colleagues and we made a, uh, a statement which I repeated at a uh, celebration of Joe's 50th year teaching. And that is that Joe Stiglitz doesn't teach economics. He teaches courage and creativity. And he applies it brilliantly as an economist in many, many different places. But he's breaking the walls down and rebuilding with a different vision in ways that have nourished us all many, many times. Thanks for doing this today, Joe. And we'll, uh, I mean, I, I look forward to listening and continuing to learn from you as I have now for almost 40 years. Well, thank you, Rob, very much and for those very kind words. Uh, the, uh, the subject uh, uh, of uh, the policy response to COVID-19 is obviously uh, uh, absolutely fascinating. So many lessons to learn about economics and uh, so many ideas about what we've done, what, what we need to do. So I prepared a, a PowerPoint and uh, let me try to uh, share it with all of you. Um, the, um, let me begin by making a, a few uh, introductory marks about what we needed to have thought about as we were designing the policy response, what is very distinctive about this crisis. Uh, then go on to a, a brief description of 
why the U.S. was in such a bad position for responding to the crisis. Then I'll talk about the objectives of what we had in mind uh, and why we failed in achieving those. And then finally come to talk about what we should be doing next. So in terms of uh, what we should have been in our minds as uh, the crisis uh, struck, uh, we're our, our, uh, about uh, four basic ideas. The first is there's a very high level of uncertainty about the course of the disease and its economic implications. Uh, and that implies that we need to have flexibility and adaptability. Uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, many people thought it was going to be a short interruption, maybe a, a, at most a 10 week interruption and there would be a quick V-shaped recovery. Uh, that was a fantasy then, and it's clear now that it's a fantasy. It's gonna be long, uh, uh, at best a, a U-shaped recovery. And when we structured the program, we didn't really take that into account. So uh, we spent, uh, we allocated uh, almost $3 trillion, but it is now clear that we're going to have to spend a lot more if we're going to address the economic consequences of the disease. One of the aspects uh, that one should have taken into account in designing a program is, uh, in terms of this uncertainty, is index programs, where expenditures are linked to outcomes, the, uh, to the evolution of the economy. And this is much better than repeatedly having to go uh, to the trough, repeatedly going to Congress. Particularly important in America's dirty politics because every time you go to the trough, uh, the special interests come in and uh, need uh, to be bribed in order to get it through uh, Congress. But it's also important because one of the real issues now is extreme precautionary behavior uh, is going to be emerge out of this crisis. Uh, we want people when the pandemic is put under the uh, under control to spend but if there's uncertainty as there will be about whether the economy is going to have a robust recovery people are going to harbor their resources they're not going to spend and uh we will emerge uh, with a deficiency of aggregate demand uh, it will be an extreme version of what you might call keynesian liquidity trap uh, and that's the direction we're going to go Right now, there's a big fight going on in Congress about uh, indexing where the Democrats are saying they ought to have indexing and Republicans say no. The um, second important point relates to this fact that we are not going to have this V-shaped recovery um, and that we're going to need much more assistance. And that means the money has to be targeted. It has to be uh, as well targeted as possible because uh, uh, there will inevitably be reluctance uh, about uh, the amounts of money that we're going to spend. Uh, the CBO already uh, is talking about uh, by uh, September, we'll have a debt GDP ratio of 101%, but it's actually going to be much higher than that. That was. Uh, a somewhat rosy scenario. Uh, the third important uh, thing to keep in mind is that uh, there's a key role of implementability. Uh, what you can implement uh, depends on the institutional infrastructure that's already in place. And the contrast between the United States and many other countries has become very evident. Uh, Argentina was able to make a decision that uh, children ought to be getting funds uh, and make that decision on a Tuesday and the funds were out there on a Friday. The United States has said for the poorest Americans, those who didn't fill out tax returns in 2019, it may be September before they're able to get their $1,200 check. We just, and that means that they're left to fend for themselves for months on end. 
another example of the limitations of our implement, uh, implementability is that uh, there are limitations in our ability to expand the unemployment insurance program rapidly. Uh, that uh, means, for instance, that uh, as uh, the uh, tens of millions of people have applied for unemployment, uh, the program has been overwhelmed and we're likely to have similar problems in the case context of uh, Medicaid. Uh, the government in some sense recognized those limitations and it turned to the banks as the implementing agency, but that was fundamentally flawed. There were conflict in, influence, uh, conflicts of interest, there were limited capacities, and we'll see some of the problems in our programs are exactly related to the choice of the banks as part of the implementation process. Uh, as an example of an alternative, we could have turned to the uh, COVID uh, to the data processing agencies, uh, which had greater capacities. Um, the final preliminary mark I wanted to make is that the COVID-19 revealed weaknesses in our markets and government and society. Uh, multiple market failures, but also uh, in terms of lack of resilience, short-sightedness, and ability to respond quickly, uh, really quite shocking that a market economy uh, like the United States couldn't even make masks. Uh, a lot of people have found it absolutely revealing about uh, the limitations of markets. But obviously, uh, we've watched government failures. But I want to emphasize the government failures are linked to the long-standing attempt to denigrate the role of collective action of science. Uh, and, uh, you know, those attempts beginning in the Reagan administration actually worked to debilitate the government and we're seeing part of the consequences of that. Um, the crisis also revealed weaknesses in our society. The massive inequalities in income, wealth, and health. Uh, COVID-19 has shown itself not to be an equal opportunity uh, disease. It goes after those with uh, health uh, problems. And uh, many of the frontline workers who are the most essential were both the lowest paid and the most exposed. Again, government didn't do what it should have done. OSHA, uh, which is our government agency for safety and health, didn't protect them. And employers, remarkably, were too short-sighted and greedy to protect them. Uh, the uh, Final introductory remark I want to make is that uh, the decisions about who gets money and what terms may shape and distort the economy for years to come. Uh, in many cases, they are life and death decisions. Uh, uh, we didn't have a vision of what kind of an economic society we wanted to see emerge from the crisis. And as we were putting out trillions of dollars, uh, we didn't think about, as I say, what kind of society economy we want. Uh, and one should recognize that crises in their aftermath tend to be moments of intense distributive conflict. Uh, we should expect nothing less. And how they resolve will have profound effects uh, on uh, our society. In fact, uh, what we've seen is that in the battle for uh, the structuring of the program, we're seeing the existing power structure, the existing power conflicts uh, uh, manifesting themselves uh, very uh, dramatically. And that, again, I'll, I'll come to uh, uh, more clearly. Well, again, as background, the U.S. was ill-prepared for the crisis. Uh, we had a uh, a weak health status, the United States uh, declining uh, life expectancy and life expectancy lower than in uh, other advanced countries, weak systems of social protection. Um, uh, all of this is related to the high level of inequality, the absence of public provision of health care, uh, and um, uh, particularly relevant, as I said before, because of the nature of COVID-19. Uh, and as ill-prepared as we were 
say in 2016, over the last three years, things have gotten much worse as the Trump administration has got funding to CDC, not replenished the national stockpile of needed medical supplies, not maintained ventilators, abolished the White House uh, office on pandemics. So I'm gonna go through very quickly some charts that show uh, uh, the, uh, the data in a very dramatic way. Um, the death rates uh, in the United States uh, in uh, virtually every core category that you think of are much worse uh, than in uh, other countries. Uh, and uh, um, the, uh, um, that's true uh, both for younger people and uh, for older people. Uh, health insurance, uh, a life expectancy in the United States is markedly lower and uh, declining. Uh, health insurance coverage uh, is lower than in other advanced countries. Uh, it's partly because other countries provide health insurance. Uh, the number of people in, uh, uh, with no health insurance obviously declined dramatically when we provided Obamacare. But now, since uh, Trump has gotten elected, that number has increased. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that has been revealed is that we created a system that was not very resilient. Uh, we were very short-sighted. Uh, and one aspect of our short-sightedness was to say, uh, we don't need to have spare tires in our cars. We don't want to have empty bags because that's a waste of resources. And uh, one of the problems of having no empty bags is when you have a surge in demand, like in a pandemic, you are ill-prepared. And so this compares the number of hospital beds per thousand in the United States with the, o the OECD. And you, all of this shows very dramatically that we were less prepared. Now, uh, let me now turn to uh, the uh, government programs. Uh, there were uh, uh, three key objectives, maintain health, protect the vulnerable, and then to ensure the preconditions of a robust uh, recovery. And that includes preventing bankruptcy cascades and protecting the balance sheet for recovery. I'll come back to that. Um, in spite of the huge magnitude of expenditures uh, uh, by some accounts, three trillion, others seven trillion, uh, it looks like the programs have failed on all three accounts. Now there's next stage that we're going to be coming to, which is once the pandemic is under control, we want to ensure a robust recovery. And this is unlikely to happen on its own. And we'll, there will be a need uh, for a large, well-designed fiscal stimulus. And it's very interesting that the chairman of the Federal Reserve made that very clear uh, in uh, his speech yesterday. So uh, let me go through each of those categories. First, maintaining health. Um, an example of what uh, we mean by maintaining health is, it's preventing contagion. Uh, we don't want those who are sick to go to work. Uh, but the US, among the advanced countries, has the poorest provision of paid sick leave, and especially poor among low paid workers. Only 30% low, only have it in the, low, uh, in the lowest decile. The interesting thing Congress recognized the importance, and they passed a law mandating paid sick leave for COVID 19, very limited, but just for COVID 19. But then under pressure from our largest corporation, they exempted 80% of uh, workers. And that of course means uh, uh, that uh, since they are living hand to mouth, uh, uh, close to ha you know, half or more of our workers uh, uh, live uh, paycheck to paycheck, have less than $500 in the bank account, if they get sick, they go to work if they possibly can. And that, of course, uh, leads to more uh, spreading of the disease. Um, on this particular slide, I've given a, a lot of other examples of what we should have done to maintain uh, better health, like OSHA, uh, 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 imposing uh, health standards. But it has refused uh, to do that. 
There's a very simple underlying economics here, and I think it really is important to emphasize this. There are large externalities. Individuals, employers, incentives are not aligned with those of society because they don't take into account the cost they impose on others by the spread of disease. It's just a, a classic example of a, 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 an externality. And uh, workers don't have bargaining power. If they had bargaining power, they would have insisted. And uh, you know, I know people here in New York who uh, were being exposed, went to the union, the union demanded, said, if you don't provide it, we'll go on strike. Uh, they got the mask, but most people in the United States are not protected uh, uh, by unions. And so they were left to fend for themselves, government didn't step in. There's a little point here that, uh, not a, a little point, but uh, uh, I, I want to emphasize, it's more uh, of a, uh, um, uh, a broader issue. Um, the in a, intellectual property regime doesn't promote access to medicines, vaccines, and other products. It may actually play a role in the lack of access. And this is going to become even more important when we go to the next stage of developing retrovirals and, and vaccines. It's something that we really ought to be focusing more on. Uh, um, the second objective was protecting the vulnerable and maintaining the workers' link with the workplace. Maintaining workers' link with the workplace place was important uh, for two reasons. It, it, it would enable uh, the economy to start back again once uh, the pandemic is put under control, but it's also uh, important because uh, it's the most cost-effective way of providing assistance. Um, it avoids the cost of rehiring, uh, Displacements are associated with hysteresis effects, lower productivity, uh, and it's especially important in the United States where the majority of our citizens depend on employer-provided health care. And in this respect, uh, the U.S. performance has been, quite frankly, dismal. 33.5 million newly unemployed. Uh, we didn't keep that link. Um, and the unemployment rate properly measured in, in what is called U6, uh, a broader measure, is somewhere between 20 and 25 plus percent. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, 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 we, we obviously didn't uh, maintain the kind of uh, link that uh, we, we had hoped. Um, this shows, uh, that the U.S. provides the low levels of unemployment insurance compared to other countries, and it's particularly low for those who are unemployed uh, for uh, more than six months. And um, the replacement rate in the United States is also low compared to other countries. Uh, the projected increase in the unemployment rate by the IMF uh, is uh, much lower, higher in the United States than in other countries, a demonstration that we've done uh, uh, a much poorer job than other countries. Explaining the failure is actually uh, uh, not that hard. The programs were not comprehensive. They were not well targeted. They were shaped more by lobbying than economic analysis. They la largely left out important sectors of the economy like state and local governments, research institutions, higher education, large NGOs. The PPP program, which is the particular program designed for small businesses, was particularly badly designed with high administrative costs in the billions of dollars with banks as intermediaries. And the result is that money, money went to the good customers of the banks construction firms, which were not listed as the most vulnerable, to large firms, it didn't go to the most vulnerable. So 4% of the loans accounted for 43% of the dollars. Even though there were a lot of small loans, most of the money went to uh, the uh, uh, very big uh, companies. There were a whole set of other uh, problems. Um, there was a provision to encourage people to uh, keep their workers. And it said, if you keep, keep your workers, uh, your loan would be forgiven. 
but there was a total lack of trust. Uh, nobody believed the government would honor that provision. Uh, and uh, so what happened is uh, many used the money to build up capital buffers, but didn't pay any attention to the uh, provisions that were designed to uh, keep workers uh, on the job. There was a lack of uh, uh, transparency, a lack of uh, prioritization. Um, it didn't, uh, we didn't identify where money would be most effective. Uh, the anal analytics of trying to identify where money was most uh, uh, central in a complex uh, networked economy is actually a very difficult question. And I've recently done a couple papers where we've uh, tried to look at uh, figuring out uh, what the answer uh, to that. Uh, let me emphasize that when I say we did uh, badly, uh, we did badly relative to others and relative to alternatives that were available. I was trying to push Congress to look at these alternatives. Other countries, Denmark and New Zealand, took an alternative tack of giving money directly to employers who maintained employment. Now, there are in Congress now, both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, proposals along these lines. The costs are a fraction of the PPP program. It's a comprehensive program. And I, even though you might say it's too late, it's not too late because unfortunately this crisis is uh, U-shaped, not a V-shape, and it's going to be worth doing now. Uh, the pandemic is going to last a lot longer uh, than June 1st, which is what uh, the program was uh, designed for. Um, and uh, to reiterate, although $2.7 trillion is, seems like a lot of money, it's so badly designed and so badly targeted, it's not going to suffice. Um, and uh, uh, that's why it's really important as we go into the next stage to think more carefully about where we want to go. So the third point was establishing the preconditions for a strong uh, and quick recovery. Part of that was providing liquidity, and, and that's where the massive money from the Federal Reserve uh, has played an important role. But it only went to corporations. There was the big lacuna was households. Uh, there was a stay on government-insured mortgage, a stay on student loans, but not on other mortgages, not on student other student loans, not on credit card debt, not on car loans. Uh, in a way, you can think about what happened is the rest of the country was put on hold, and yet the banks will continue to collect interest. And it's even worse than that because in our credit card debts, there's basically usurious interest rates, fees, and uh, the implication for the recovery is the balance sheet effects are going to be disastrous. And there are already symptoms. The failure to pay rents is up from 18% a year ago to 31% of the tenants. So we are facing a problem. Now there are, uh, as we think about the recovery, three critical tasks. First, uh, we need to stimulate the economy and the standard macro multipliers uh, could act in reverse uh, with a vengeance. Uh, that is to say, as people cut their spending because of lack of balance sheet and precautionary behavior, uh, it will uh, weaken the economy uh, strongly. Second, we want to avoid debt spirals. I'll come to talk about that. And third, uh, we want to manage supply chain problems. Um, the macro model, model multipliers are very uh, familiar. We saw those in 2008. Uh, the point that this began differently from any other crisis is important, but it will morph into some of the uh, manifestations of a traditional crisis. The balance sheet of firms, households, and banks are being hurt badly. There's an increase in uncertainty greater than normal, and that will induce precautionary behavior, and both will contribute to significant reductions in aggregate demand. And we know from the 2008 crisis that multipliers and deep downturns are large, and uh, therefore uh, this may be, unless we do something, a long and deep uh, downturn. The second thing is debt spirals are the kind of thing that uh, I saw so vividly in the 1997 uh, 
global uh, East Asia financial uh, crisis, where uh, seventy percent of the firms uh, in Indonesia, fifty percent of those in uh, Korea, and almost fifty percent in Thailand went into uh, default or, or uh, uh, financial stress. Uh, financial gridlock is easy to describe. Bankruptcy cascade, A doesn't pay B, B can't pay C, C can't repay A. You get what is called systemic bankruptcy. These are extraordinarily hard to resolve. Uh, a lot of the money is trying, they, that the Fed is putting out is trying to prevent that. But uh, given the big holes in our system, and given the high level of debt that the low interest rates uh, and the lack of oversight have resulted before COVID-19 means that we are, uh, will be seeing, I think, high levels of uh, debt. And uh, in the context of the 1997 East Asia crisis, Marcus Miller and I uh, uh, made a proposal for a super chapter 11, um, but of course, even more important is providing money in a way which doesn't require uh, bankruptcy. Uh, easy to do with for publicly listed companies, but it's a lot harder for privately uh, held companies. The third uh, issue is uh, the uh, supply chain problems. Um, as we said uh, in the beginning, it's not just a demand problem for now, uh, a stimulus is a misnomer, but it, there's a lack of supply, uh, shop down on production. And that, uh, of course, will create its own lack of demand. And there could eventually see shortages in important products, including medicine and certain foods. And this will be especially imp uh, uh, important with the interruption of global supply chains. And especially if some countries were to, worried about shortages, impose export restraints. Uh, and uh, there's also going to be large changes in the structure of demand, at least uh, in the short run. Less demand for air travel, more demand for Zoom. And markets uh, on their own don't manage uh, such changes well. So we are going to need to think uh, uh, more carefully about what we do about these uh, problems. Now, uh, some people are seeing this enormous increase in liquidity have become worried about inflation. Um, I think that there will be problems, as I said before, in particular goods. Uh, and we will need to consider government interventions in the production distribution of certain essential goods. Um, but at the macro level, it's, I think my judgment is more likely the more likely outcome is there's going to be deficiency of aggregate demand uh, as a result of uh, the balance sheet effects combined with precautionary behavior. It will require careful monitoring, um, uh, but I think, uh, as I say, uh, the, the weight of evidence right now is that we're going to be facing a deficiency uh, in um, uh, demand. So let me finally come to talk about what are some of the key elements in the next, pa uh, next package. Um, I began by talking about the par paramount importance of health. Uh, we aren't going to go back to a normal economy until we uh, 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 get the pandemic under control. And that's why the key health provisions are essential. The second is extending unemployment insurance with uh, triggers. Um, a particular point on this that has not gotten a lot of attention, although it's in one of the bills before Congress, is that new entrants to the labor force uh, won't be covered by unemployment. Uh, they're going to be facing a very hard labor market, and we need uh, a comprehensive program along the lines of something that Europe has done in the 2000 Euro, uh, 8, 10 Euro crisis, Every young person should be in a job, in school, or in a training program. Um, the third thing is, rather than the PPP uh, go to uh, uh, the Paycheck uh, Guarantee Program, the New Zealand uh, 
Denmark program where you get money directed to companies to pay workers. Uh, the, the fourth thing is comprehensive support, including aid to states and localities. Really important. I'll, uh, next slide, we'll talk about that. Aid to higher education. So all the programs need to be accompanied by conditions and priorities corresponding to our vision of the post-pandemic economy, uh, which includes a green economy with more transparency, better governance, better treatment of workers, fewer abuses of corporate governance. And so finally, let me say uh, the importance of the uh, essential role for support of state and local government. Uh, I'm emphasizing this, it should be obvious but it is right now turning out to be one of the big controversies in Congress. Um, in the 2008 crisis, tax revenues declines were twice that of GDP. Uh, and because the stakes have balanced budget frameworks, expenditures declines uh, have to be uh, decreased in tandem. Um, and because these are uh, labor intensive, uh, uh, the um, uh, employment decrease will be even greater. So the bottom line is that uh, if we don't provide support for state and local government, we will have built in automatic austerity, uh, austerity not coming from the top, we've obviously spent the money, but austerity coming from below. And that will impede recovery. If you look at the numbers, that alone will make sure that we uh, will uh, have elevated levels of unemployment. Uh, the Fed has uh, talked about lending facilities for the stakes. That's not the problem. The stakes have a balanced budget framework and if the revenues go down, they have to cut back on their expenditures. Uh, the, uh, Mitch McConnell uh, has said they should go into bankruptcy, actually. Uh, he should know better than that because uh, there is no provision in our bankruptcy law for stakes to go into uh, uh, bankruptcy. Governor Como said, uh, challenged him and said, uh, uh, I, uh, why doesn't Congress try to pass a bankruptcy law and see what the consequences to be? It's really important. Uh, it's a key to education, welfare, social protection, and health. So this is a health crisis undermining stakes and local governments will be undermining uh, health. Well, I've tried to uh, go through uh, very quickly uh, some of the elements of um, what we should have done, what we need to be doing. There's a lot more uh, that I could have gone into uh, I focused on the United States. The problems are parallel in other countries, but the United States has provided a, a good pedagogic tool because it's done things so badly. Uh, but uh, there is a global problem. There are uh, is going to be a, a, a cascade of, of uh, global uh, bankruptcies unless we do something uh, internationally. And I haven't been able to talk about that, but if, in the question period, uh, if, welcome uh, some discussion of those issues. So thank you, and let's open it to questions. Joe, thank you. That was an amazing uh, talk because it covered so many different issues and gave us some real insight on what's actually happening in the moment. Uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, we actually have participants from all over the world, so some of them are um, questions having to do with the global economy, but I had a question that was um, related actually to the US. Uh, one of the points that you made, which I think is critically important, is that the packages that we've had so far have been very badly designed and very badly targeted. Um, I'm sitting in Silicon Valley and there's a lot of, there has been a lot of discussion for several years now about whether or not a UBI would be the right way to go, specifically to talk about issues around automation. Uh, and many people feel like this, what's happening now is a vindication of some of these ideas because we're seeing what in some ways looks like a UBI. Um, given your point about how badly targeted uh, the money that has gone out already has been, 
what does this imply for thinking about a UBI for, for the future? Does this really look like a UBI? Is this telling us that we should be thinking about UBI or is in fact it telling us that we need to be going in exactly the opposite direction? Well, uh, the $1,200 uh, payment that we uh, was part of the uh, uh, package uh, is a kind of UBI, not quite uh, universal because there were income limits, but it went to uh, the vast majority of Americans. Uh, it was necessary because we recognized we couldn't do a better job of targeting, although the Paycheck Guarantee Program I talked about does actually uh, uh, a much better job than, uh, for instance, the PPP program. But uh, when we uh, recovered from the pandemic, uh, there's still, one of the reasons I, I've not been a big fan of UBI is when I look at, at uh, the world for the next 30 years, I see uh, huge needs. Uh, we have to make a green transition. We need huge investments to make that green transition. Uh, we have to care for the aged. They're going to be. Uh, we we have inadequacies in in our infrastructure, uh, in our education system, uh, in our research. So I think of all the needs that our society has, and uh, so I believe that for the next thirty years, if we can organize ourselves we should be uh, committed to making sure that everybody who wants a job can get a job. We need uh, uh, to use those labor services. And for most people, work is an important part of their life. So they want to work. So they want to work. We need their, their efforts. And so rather than UBI, I'd like to move in that uh, direction and fulfill the commitment we made in 1948. Uh, we made a commitment in 1948 that we would provide jobs for everybody uh, the, in the Full Employment Act. So we made the commitment. We unfortunately haven't always honored it. Finally, let me say that uh, the challenge of maintaining full employment is going to be made more difficult by COVID-19. And the reason I say that is that um, the cost of labor will go up significantly because the organization of labor is going to have to embed social distancing. And as we think of that extra cost and that extra risk, uh, some firms are, it's going to tilt firms to move into more capital intensive processes. So I think that we are going to see that, for instance, uh, one of the things that has been exposed by COVID-19 is the lack of resilience of our global supply chains. There's going to be some insourcing, but when it comes back into the United States, it'll be done by robots, not by humans. So uh, I think uh, the labor market is going to be facing, uh, to put it euphemistically, challenges uh, in coming years. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to shift now to some of the questions we have coming in. Um, we have a question here from Jordi Velasco that says, Us, are monet uh, modern monetary theory, theory recipes good enough to tackle this particular crisis? Yeah, let me try to explain uh, the origins of modern, modern monetary theory and uh, why uh, it actually raises the questions that uh, should be a warning. Um, the idea of modern monetary theory is, was stimulated by the fact that in the 2008 crisis, the Federal Reserve expanded its balance sheet from roughly 800 billion to 4 trillion, and there was no inflation. And so people would say, well, uh, why don't we just print money and that will uh, enable us to finance anything we want? 
of course, there's some limit, but clearly we can do a lot more than we've done in the past. The reason that the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet from 800 billion to 4 trillion didn't have an inflationary pressure, uh, consequences was the money just went into banks' balance sheets. It just went into the banks and wasn't lent out. So it didn't work to stimulate the economy. So because it didn't stimulate the economy, it didn't put any inflationary pressure. If the banks had lent the money, then it would have led to an increase in aggregate demand. And an increase in aggregate demand of that magnitude might have been inflationary. Now, we're going through exactly the same thing right now. And I mentioned that very briefly in my talk. Uh, I worry that what is going to happen, you know, the $2.7 uh, trillion, uh, much of that is not going to show up, translate into a, a sustained increase in aggregate demand. A lot of it is going to be held, not now just by banks, but by uh, firms uh, who get that money uh, as precautionary balances. They're extremely nervous and they'll just hold on it. Now, some of them will take that money and put it into the stock market, uh, into assets. So we'll see some asset price increases. One of the reasons why the stock market is doing very well is the Fed is putting out money and some of that money is going to being held in those forms. And um, because bonds are paying such low interest rates, but it's not going to go into an increase in aggregate demand. So modern monetary theory can't be used for saying, let's use that for financing real investments by government if you increase government spending in real terms, not in transfer payments, but by building roads, say, by a few trillion dollars, uh, that would uh, start in a, once we get back to normal, not, not now, but once we get back to normal, uh, that would have, uh, 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 could have inflationary pressures. I have a question here from Anissa Nuachuku. What is the potential of recent initiatives like the Technology Access Partnership just announced by the UN to increase access to critical IP and build capacity in multiple countries and regions to support highly concentrated global supply chains of critical goods? Well, I don't know the details of that particular uh, program, but uh, Obviously, uh, um, one of the concerns I mentioned, again, very briefly in my talk was intellectual property. Uh, one has to have access to intellectual property. Um, one of the uh, lack of access to intellectual property uh, leads to market concentration, inequality, and uh, puts a uh, emerging markets in developing countries at a disadvantage. And I've long been engaged in discussions of uh, trying to create what we call a development-oriented intellectual property regime. TRIPS was not development-oriented. It was very much an a, a intellectual property regime uh, written for and by the advanced countries, and particularly by uh, intellectual property interest in those countries that were not really interested in maximizing even growth in the United States. It was really maximizing rents for uh, the owners of the intellectual property in uh, the United States and in Europe. Yeah. Uh, we have a number of questions about inequality. Uh, I'm going to read one of them from Mohammed Badran, which says, in the post-COVID-19 era, what is the tentative idea on what would happen or could happen to inequality between and within countries? Well, I think within countries, it's very clear that uh, it seems to be exacerbating those inequalities, and you know, certainly in the United States. I mentioned uh, that it is not an equal opportunity disease, that it's going after those at the bottom. Uh, those at the bottom are uh, 
uh, uh, being con you know, laid off, uh, facing more economic pressure, uh, those at the top can continue doing what they're doing on Zoom uh, and work remotely. Those at the bottom actually have to have physical presence. And so the disease itself is uh, affecting uh, differentially those at the top and the bottom. But this is going to then uh, have multiple uh, multiplier effects. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, the balance sheet of those at the bottom is going to be much more devastated. There is increasing worry about foreclosures. Uh, will they be able to uh, 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 pay back? Uh, will they lose their homes? Will they lose their cars? Uh, so unless we do something, I think it will be, it will exacerbate the wealth inequalities uh, across uh, the economy. And especially true in economies like the United States. So the reason why I say that is, for instance, a lot of individuals have borrowed money uh, to pay for their education. Very uh, American uh, problem. Two trillion dollars of student debt uh, doesn't exist in most other countries. A few other countries have it. Um, uh, if you don't have a job, you're not able to pay back your student debt. Uh, interest accumulates. And so, uh, again, uh, it's going to uh, affect those uh, inequalities. Now, across countries, uh, we don't yet know uh, how this is going to play out. Um, the less developed countries, the emerging markets, obviously have less capacity to handle uh, the disease, uh, to respond. Uh, health conditions are worse. Uh, people live in greater proximity. So there are many reasons to be uh, very worried about the, the disease and its economic impact, impact on uh, less developed countries. An interesting aspect of this disease that we don't fully understand is it seems to have affected some countries much worse than others. And some of the developing countries about whom one would be, about which one would be most worried have only had a limited attack. Um, some uh, emerging markets have managed it very well, like Argentina has done a very good job at managing uh, the disease, but at some economic cost. So uh, there is, if you look at, across countries, there are very varying uh, impacts, uh, both the disease directly and, and the economic impact. And of course, that is, means that some of the countries are going to be much more, uh, 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 much weaker. Uh, one of the big uncertainties is going into the crisis, many countries were uh, overburdened by debt. Financial markets had over lent. A lot of us said after uh, uh, the Jubilee 2000 debt restructuring, we should keep debt down. Uh, but, you know, it's been 20 years and debt has now uh, risen. Uh, banks rushed in in many cases into many countries. And uh, there, are, there is, are worries about debt crises. Uh, the IMF has had a large number of applications for assistance and uh, making things even more difficult is of course the crash of the oil price for oil exporting countries uh, and commodity prices also are not doing very well. And there's a flood of money out of emerging markets. Uh, money is, if we say, is rushing uphill uh, like it has never done before. So there are many reasons to believe that the crisis will aggravate disparities between uh, the richest and the uh, countries and the rest. Uh, a lot of this will depend, again, on how we manage that. I've been advocating, for instance, uh, very strongly, we need um, 
a 500 billion SDR issue, special drawing right issue with the IMF. Uh, and the head of the IMF has advocated that, uh, but so far uh, it's not been forthcoming. Uh, I'm going to go to one more question, which is actually a difficult one. You've laid out some really important um, ideas for how we should think about solutions. Um, a number of people have asked, including a question here by Nick Bachewski. What are the odds of getting something like this passed through Congress? Uh, I think we will get something passed through Congress. Uh, it will have some of the ingredients that I've talked about. Um, unfortunately, we have a very polarized uh, Congress uh, and uh, with a lot of ideology playing out on the Republican Party. Um, so uh, until November, until we elect a new Congress in November, if we get a Democratic Congress in uh, November, a Democratic Senate, a de Democratic House, and a Democratic administration, I believe we will get something along the lines that I've outlined. If not, um, what I see is, uh, the ingredients of a political compromise emerging is the following. Uh, the business interest in the Republican Party, their number one priority right now is uh, immunity from liability. Uh, the, uh, they've sent their workers, like in the meatpacking plants, into work without protective gear, without masks. I gave the example uh, in New York, uh, where, you know, simple product of butcher, they want them to go in to work without masks. Union stepped in and stopped that and said, you have to have masks, and the employer did it. But in much of the country, we don't have unions. We, uh, government hasn't stepped forward. And uh, the employers want immunity to be able to do whatever they want. Um, that's number one, and a lot of them are really afraid of suit. It seems to me not unreasonable to say, if we adopt strong guidelines, protective guidelines, and you comply with those guidelines, then and not, not just good faith effort, I mean, really comply with those guidelines. If you can't provide masks, you don't ask them to show up for work. And if you don't, you know, protective gear, if you don't, if you need social distancing and you tell them to be very crowded, then you redesign the workplace. But if you really do the things that are now recognized to be necessary for uh, health, then you should be protected from suit. So that kind of a deal combined with aid to state and local governments not the amount that they need, but some compromise amount um, is likely uh, to emerge. I'm not so confident that the paycheck guarantee scheme that I described uh, before as being really a key ingredient that's worked so well in so many other countries. I, I think it really should be. I'm, I, I'm not that optimistic. I do think that this, the, the imperative of providing uh, uh, some security for unemployment uh, is sufficiently great that something will be do done about that, but probably uh, whether we'll get the automatic stabilizers that we need to give people the confidence that our economy needs, that's a little bit uh, still up in the air. So, I, the answer is the nature of politics. It'll be a compromise. Uh, it won't be what we need. And the result of that is uh, we won't be going back uh, any, anything like a uh, V-shape. We won't see that upper part of the U-shape uh, during the Trump administration, uh, during this year. And uh, whether it'll be 2021 or 2022 or 2023, 
will really depend on the policies uh, that we're going to uh, embark on. And unfortunately, it won't be until 2021 before we will have a chance to really get the policies that we need. Thank you, Joe. That was really interesting and um, very instructive. And I really wish that um, we could find a way to make sure that our policymakers could um, hear all of these wonderful points that you've made to us today. I think it's critically important. Um, so thank you for taking the time to speak with us yes. today. I'd also like to thank all our participants from all over the world. Um, one of the few silver linings of this pandemic has been that we can directly reach out to so many people through webinars um, and actually connect with our INET community all around the world, much more than we had been doing before. Uh, we actually have two more webinars next week. So on Wednesday at 11.30 Eastern, we're gonna have a round table on the impact of the crisis on the Eurozone with Maurice Schillerick, uh, Laurence Boone, Adam Tooze, and it's gonna be moderated by Gillian Tett of the Financial Times. And on Thursday at noon, we're gonna have Nobel Prize winning economist, Michael Spence, joining us to discuss strategies for reopening the global economy. So I very much hope you will join us for those events too. And you can register on the INET website. And I wanna thank you all. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.